in the Maternal and Child Health Research Institute was delighted to sponsor this for a couple different reasons. First, some of the speakers that um, are on the agenda for today have been supported by the Research Institute, so it's really exciting for us. The other thing is I love the fact that it's at this location because what the Research Institute is trying to do is push out from the School of Medicine, get across campus drive, and engage with people in a number of other disciplines. And so it's really exciting to have a, you know, a presence here. Um, so thank you, Marsha, for the opportunity to work with you on this particular symposium. And as well, I know your center has supported some work relevant to children and adolescents as well. All right, so my research focus for many, many years, for almost 20 years, has been the impact of childhood chronic diseases on skeletal development, things like kidney failure and inflammatory bowel disease. But we had to spend a lot of time trying to understand what's normal um, <clears throat> and what are some of the sexual, the, the sex and race and you know, pubertal effects on skeletal development because many of our children with chronic disease have delayed puberty and so there's a, needed to really get a handle on this. So this uh, schematic just tells you how your bone mass changes across the life course. So not surprisingly, adolescence is characterized by really rapid bone accrual. Um, and then you reach early in, uh, as a young adult, what's called peak bone mass. And you can see here that males have a higher peak bone mass than females. And even if you adjust for the fact that they're taller, this gender difference persists, as I'll show you. And then, unfortunately, with aging, there's this inexorable decline in bone, and it's much more accelerated in women around menopause. And that's the driver, then, of the fact that osteoporotic fractures, which have a great deal of morbidity related with them, are, occur to women to a greater than degree in men. So for that reason, um, well, let me just, so for that reason, we feel like really building the best skeleton you can during childhood and adolescence, whether it's in healthy children or children with diseases, is the best thing we can do in terms of lifelong bone health. So the bone, uh, bone mineral density in childhood study was funded by the National Institute of Child Health, uh, Child, National Institute of Child Health and Human Development, an NIH study where we enrolled 2,200 kids from six different locations around the country and measured them annually for five years, and were able to finally create these kinds of curves that are the same software we use when you do growth uh, curves if you're looking at height or weight or body mass index in a child. Now you can track kids um, in terms of their whole body bone mineral content. We have separate uh, charts for males and females similar to growth, but also for uh, according to race because there are some real differences here. And I think if you, I hope you can see between these two um, diagrams here, the axes are different. The females goes up to 3,000, the males goes up to 3,500, but males have, you know, um, start out quite similar and they end up with a significantly greater peak bone mass as I showed you on that last graph. So it's been almost 20 years since the, since the NIH had its osteoporosis consensus conference and one of their key findings or key conclusions is that peak bone mass is a critical determinant of lifelong bone strength and then they launched into this need for all these studies on children and steroids and chronic diseases which you know was the first sentence of every grant I wrote for the next decade. Um, but we talk a lot about, when we talk about bone, we talk about bone density, because older women have osteoporosis, you, you go to get a bone density test. But there's really, really much more about the bone that is, tells you about how strong it's gonna be. So bone strength is a function of both how dense the bone is, but also bone quality. And bone quality can refer to a variety of things. So the geometry, the microarchitecture, bone turnover, which we'll talk about in a minute, as well as micro damage repair, and then how well the bone is mineralized. Increasingly, we can measure some of these things. Turnover is tricky because you have to do bone biopsies and there's no good way to measure really turnover. But for some of the other things, we're getting better with more advanced imaging techniques. So I need to orient this audience to just some bone, some of the terminology. So this is the, this is the upper arm, the humerus. And at the ends of the long bone, you have this sort of honeycomb type structure that looks like this. And that's your trabecular bone. And based on the thickness and the connectivity, of the structure, it's very light, but it's very strong. And then down the shaft of a long bone, it becomes like a, it's like a pipe, and there's no, none of this trabecular bone. And then really the strength of the bone is a function of the diameter of this, as well as the density of the material. So if you blow this up, this is cortical bone, this is trabecular bone. For trabecular bone, you have microarchitecture. For cortical bone, you have porosity and mineralization, how much mineral is packed in there. So we <coughs> thought it was gonna be really important to understand the effects of sex on each of these different, every one of these components of bone quality. So first we've gotta think about a little bit about how growth is different than what happens in adults. So this is a bone biopsy. 
This blue is the bone. It could be one of these little sort of spicules here. So this is the bone, and these are the osteoblasts. And the osteoblasts are the cells that form bone. So the osteoblasts come along and they lay down this osteoid, this collagen matrix. Um, they're, they're these columnar cells. But what they're actually doing is following the osteoclast. So the osteoclasts are these multinucleated cells with a ruffled border. They come along, they chew up the bone, and then the osteoblasts follow them. So they're connected in time and space. The osteoblasts replace the bone. And for the young people in this room, the students, you are completely re replacing the bone. So whatever bone you remove through this process, you're replacing. Unfortunately, some of us are in negative bone balance where we're not replacing all of this bone. And so each time this cycle happens, we lose a little bit of our bone. And you can see here with aging how these struts become thinner and then they actually start to disconnect and they really lose the architecture that's so important for strength. So this is bone remodeling. It's what's happening in all of us sitting right here. Um, so in kids, it's a very different process because in kids, the bones are actually changing in their dimensions. So as they ch increase in length, they've got to get bigger in dimension. And so you have to lay down new bone on the outside surface. You resorb bone on the inside surface because the bone's sort of moving in space. It doesn't just get thicker and thicker and thicker. You actually can remove bone from the inside surface. And then you have to resorb bone along here with your, so your osteoclasts have to resorb here and here, and your osteoblasts have to form here and here. So it's very different. It's not synchronized in place and time um, than that sort of unit to the same degree. So sex hormones or diseases or various things that affect bone are going to have a very site-specific effect and may have really lasting influence. So my, my research is focused on prednisone and steroids and what it does to the growing skeleton. And we've shown it inhibits this process so these kids end up with smaller bones. So this is modeling as opposed to remodeling. So let's imagine now that this is the cross-section. So we're just going to take a slice through here. Um, um, and so this is the cross-section. And the bone strength, the section modulus, which is an engineering term, which is a function of the bone strength and bending and torsion, is a function of the outer or the periosteal radius to the fourth minus the endosteal radius. So it's this radius, the outer periosteal, the inner endosteal to the fourth divided by the periosteal. So because this is to the fourth, if you have even a little bit smaller outer dimension, you're going to have a much, much weaker bone. And so if you remove this little bit of bone on the outside, you would have to put this much more on the inside to have the same strength. So just looking at how much bone mass two different people have isn't enough. You have to understand how that bone structure, sort of how it is in the three-dimensional um, structure. Okay. So what happens in puberty? So this is an, an, a paper that um, came out in a review in 2002, and the work was done much earlier than that. They, they took hand films. So they had hand films on a very, very, very large number of kids in a, in a repository. You know, they just an x-ray of their hands. And using little calipers, these are the metacarpals. That's your bones in your finger. And they, so they looked at how long the bone was. So as the bone's increasing in length. And then they looked at the outer dimension, the periosteal outer diameter. And they looked at the, med, the medullary, so the hole in the middle, the inner diameter. And they said, what happens over time? Now, these aren't the hand films on the same kids being followed over time. These are just a variety of kids at each different age. But the what happened is the boys and the girls had a pretty similar same outer diameter. But as they got older, the boys were preferentially putting bone on the outside circumference. And so the outer diameter was getting bigger in boys than in girls. And in contrast, girls were putting bone on the inside diameter so that it was actually shrinking. So girls were contracting and adding bone on the inside surface, and boys were adding bone on the outside surface. And if you think about that equation I showed you for strength, because the boys are really at an advantage because that outer dimension really drives strength. Now, the literature on what's driving this and what's driving this is really, really difficult. And this is sort of a gross oversimplification. But the thinking is that estrogen promotes bone accrual on the inner surface and actually inhibits bone accrual on the outer surface. And then testosterone promotes bone accrual on the outer surface. And the, where the growth factors and IGF-1 come into this, the insulin growth factor 1, is really complicated. And there's a really difficult big review article where they looked at all these preclinical studies where they knocked out all the different, and all the different receptors for estrogen and androgens. And it was one of those papers where you read it in the end, you go, OK, now I know less than when I started because it's such a morass. But this is sort of the thinking on it, and there's a lot of nuances, which I'll get to. 
Okay, so I showed you what it looked like in the hand. Well, that's not terribly compelling. So we used this little baby CAT scan here, which allowed us to measure 1,000 healthy children, adolescents, and young adults, and with a very, very, very low dose of radiation. And here is, a, so this is your tibia, and we did in the middle of the tibia, and there's the bone. It looks like a pipe. Um, you can't quite see it here, but the muscle, you can see the muscle belly, and then you can see the fat. I don't know if you can appreciate those two shades. But we can measure periosteal circumference, endosteal circumference, section modulus, cortical density. And then down here at the ankle, this is that sort of honeycomb bone, but unfortunately it's not really high enough resolution to say a lot about the architecture. You can just say how much bone is there. You can see in Crohn's, these, these, when I picked these images, I matched them on bone length. So you can see that this kid with inflammatory bowel disease has a smaller outer circumference and has less bone in here. Um, and that's sort of all I'm going to say about <coughs> um, chronic disease. So we took about 650 um, individuals between ages 5 and 30, and we really wanted to understand the gender, the sex differences in, all, in particularly in the cortical bone structure, trying to move beyond the hand. We also were really interested in some race differences. There's a lot of controversy there. I don't have time to get into that right now. But so we we're focusing on the, on, the, on the sex differences. So this is section modulus, cortical section modulus, right? That formula I showed you before. We can explain 88% of the variability in section modulus across these 650 individuals. It's a complicated model, but what I'm trying to get at here is you can see adjusted for how long the bone is, adjusted for age. At progressively greater tanner stage, you have progressively greater bone strength. Girl, uh, girls are lower than boys, but this is sort of the key is that in, when you finish puberty, so the girls are lower than boys all along, but when you finish puberty, then they're even lower. So, bone, so you have a statistically significant sex by tanner stage interaction. So they start out a little bit lower, they become progressively more and more lower, and then by the time you get to tanner five, they're significantly lower. So this is what that looks like. So girls are black, they're just a little bit lower than the boys, which are the open circles, but you can see by the time they finish puberty, you know, sort of somewhere in here, they really have ended up much lower. These plots are adjusted for bone length, so it's not that their bones are longer, and that's a whole other morass trying to tease out the literature is understanding what the differences are in strength when you adjust for bone length. So now we had this in 650 individuals, and we had a, we had a sense of what was normal so we could start studying chronic disease. And then, so that was just section modulus. So that just told you sort of that measure of bone strength that incorporates both periosteal and endosteal, outer and inner circumference. So then we went through and we looked at all these different outcomes to try to tease apart what was really happening. So this is tr pretty tricky. This is that same, these are the same data I just showed you for section modulus and there was a tanner five interaction. So there was a significant sex tanner interaction where they were even, so girls are lower and then they're a lot lower because you add the two together in Tanner 5. Um, what's driving it is that girls have smaller periosteal circumferences, more and more so, the more mature they get, but they have a smaller endosteal circumference. That's the inside of the bone. So in that case, smaller means more bone on the inside circumference. So this is exactly what the data in the hands were showing, is that progressively as you go through puberty, boys have a bigger outer dimension, girls have a smaller inner dimension. So this gender difference, sex difference in this parameter that really, really captures strength well. I should have said if you take a bone and you measure this with this exact kind of CT, if you take a cadaver bone, the section modulus it correlates with three-point bending with an R squared, I think above 0.9. So this is a good measure of bone strength. So section modulus increases by periosteal or outer bone formation in males, and let girls have less. Their bones are getting bigger. They're just not getting bigger as much and then they have this actual addition of bone on the inside surface. So then, so then we started thinking about where does muscle fit into this? And if you see up here, it says biomechanical forces. So biomechanical forces, you always hear about how weight-bearing activity is good for your bone. So what is that? How does that happen? Um, so this is the ulnar mo loading model. This is a rat, and you can take their limb, and you can push on it, and you can compress it, and when you push on it, it, it actually deforms it a little bit, it bends a little bit, and that creates a lot of stress on the bone. And so if you take this bone and you um, apply, you do this ulnar loading, so you really biomechanically load it, and it could be like high impact sports or just a lot of muscle forces, the places where the bone is the thinnest is gonna be the part of that bone that experiences the most strain. So it's not, you can imagine, this is gonna be the first place it's gonna break. So 
the place, this is how much strain. So right here is the measure of how much strain that bone experiences or how much it's deformed. So the more the bone is strained, the more you inhibit the production of, through the SOS gene of something by the osteocytes, which are the little cells that are embedded in the bone and sense biomechanical forces, you inhibit this gene so you produce less of something called sclerostin. Sclerostin works through the wind beta catenin pathway to inhibit bone formation. So you're down-regulating something that inhibits bone formation, so then you get more bone formation and you get most of it at the part of the bone that experiences the greater strain. And that's called the mechanostat. The bone that experiences the most strain is going to increase the most in its dimension so that it doesn't break. OK, so what about physical activity? So this is um, a really clever study. So if you wanted to know what does weight-bearing activity and loading the skeleton do to your bone structure and strength, you can imagine that you know, people are going to want to go out and look at elite athletes. So let's take gymnasts, right? They have incredible forces on their forearms when they vault or when they tumble. And yes, their forearms are much bigger. Or you take triple jumpers who land, and yes, their tibias are much bigger. But then people start to think about, well, these are elite athletes. And is it really applying to um, other kids who maybe there's some nutri you know, genetics, <coughs> nutrition, all kinds of things that are different. So the beauty of the tennis model is you have your racket arm, which is the one that's being subjected to all the forces, and you have your non-racket arm. So there's your control. And so the genetics and the, the environment and everything else is taken out of the equation. So if I was to go around and go eat, ask of each of you to stick your limbs in my CAT scanner or, or in my DEXA machine, I could tell if you were right-handed or left-handed. Because if you're your dominant hand all, if you're always had a, has a little bit more bone. So there's always a little bit of side to side difference. So this is just the bone mineral content. What this shows you is that girls, this is a study in girls, because obviously it's before onset of men's season after, if you're expo exposing that limb to a lot of biomechanical loading in the years up to puberty, you have a much bigger bone. There's just a lot more bone there. So you can have 20 percent more bone mineral content, and it's not that it's packed in denser, it's that the bone's actually bigger. So you, can, you get a much bigger bone. You get a bigger outer periosteal circumference. And it's the pre-pubertal or early pubertal bone that's really um, responds nicely to biomechanical loading. So there's this idea that there's this window of opportunity to get in and impact the bone. So something about the sex steroids are making the bone more responsive to the loading. So we came back to this, and there was some literature that was, we really thought was sort of fatally flawed because it wasn't taking differences in bone length into account, and it was describing all these weird sex interactions with muscle in terms of effects on bone. But what we did here, so here's the part of the curve I showed you before. Um, you know, girls uh, have a smaller periosteal circumference, more so the more mature they are, and have a smaller endosteal circumference, the more so the more mature they are. We then want, then I could spend a whole other hour just talking to you about sex differences in muscle. I, don't, I think we all know boys have more muscle. They also can generate more force relative to a given amount of muscle. So that was part of this paper as well. But what we wanted to know is how much of these sex differences in bone were just because of the differences of biomechanical loading in muscle. So we adjusted for muscle. And now you can see these sex differences are really about half as much. But they're still there. So that means it's not just because of the muscle. A lot of people talk about the functional muscle bone unit and say everything in bone needs to be interpreted in the context of the muscle. But this says there's still, an, there's still something going on with sex above and beyond muscle mass. And we've done similar things with muscle strength. OK, so the greater muscle area was, a sh oh yeah, so muscle was highly, highly significant in these models. So the more muscle you have, the bigger bone you have. Um, and then when you adjust for gender different sex differences in muscle, you attenuate the sex differences in bone. We did not find any hint that the impact of muscle on bone, and I use the word impact loosely because this is observational data, was different in males and females. And some other literature had suggested that. But um, So the association of muscle bone was similar in males and females, but the males had more muscle, and that attenuated some of the differences in bone. OK, so that, that's pretty macro geometry, right? That we need to get much more refined. And so that original CT I showed you with that kid in the scanner um, was pretty low resolution, if you remember, that you really couldn't appreciate the architecture. So this is the machine we have on a roster Darrow now. Um, this is me. So you can put, uh, here's a kid with a tibia. And uh, you know a kid, you can put the tibia in, or you can put the radius in. You can put the leg or the arm in. 
And then you can do this very, very, very high resolution image. So you can go down at the end of the bone and you can't quite appreciate it in this figure, but we can get really, really detailed information each and every trabeculae, you know, in terms of its thickness and its density and how it's connected to each other and up here in the cortical bone. Now this shows these little, I don't know if you can appreciate, these are actually holes. There's pores on the inside of the bone. Um, and this younger person, Marsha, that's deep, um, and this older, not old, older, because that's me, person has a little, has more porosity on the inner circumference of the bone. So you can, that's exactly what you would expect in someone my age. So you can detect these differences in porosity. You can then work with engineers. This is a slice through this region and measure, like they do finite element analysis when they want to measure the force on airplane wings or on bridges, and you can model and simulate the bone strength. So then we thought, let's take this to the next level, level and understand sex differences in some of these other uh, types of microarchitecture. So the, a lot of this data is preliminary. <coughs> Excuse me. These are like hot off the press. So we've got about 300 children and adolescents through the lab on a rostradero. This is trabecular thickness. So think back to that early diagram of that honeycomb. And now we're measuring how thick those trabeculae are because the thinking is that IGF-1 makes the trabeculae thicker. But is it really, is it IGF-1? Is it testosterone? Is it estrogen? So what we see is that trabecular thickness doesn't really seem to differ according to Tanner stage. So it's clearly, it's not estrogen, and it's probably not IGF-1 because these girls have higher IGF-1 levels. Again, cross-sectional data, we're bringing them all back two years later, but cross-sectional. But clearly something's happening as boys move from sort of pre-pubertal to early pubertal, and then become, frankly, more pubertal. There's a bump up in trabecular thickness. So we still have a lot of work to do to try to tease this apart, but I really think these are the first data that are giving us some insight into sex differences in trabecular thickness, sex and uh, tanner differences. Now, the other thing is we are the first person to take this technology into the mid-shaft of the bone. That um, Everybody else until now has used the old generation of scanner that can only do it at the very end of the bone. So we were interested in porosity, right? I showed you those tibias with the pores in them, and we know estrogen deficiency really increases porosity. We, and if, this just makes the point that if you measure it down here where everybody else has measured it so far, you can't pick up anything. But if you measure it up in the middle of the bone, something's clearly going on with this very high porosity. So this is at the mid-shaft, and this is down at the end. Something really interesting is going on with porosity in these younger kids actually before puberty, and then it seems like by the time you hit 15, the porosity really goes away. That was really surprising to me. I thought we were going to see, if we were going to see anything, we were going to see it later in puberty. Um, and we had to go back into some old biopsy literature to try to make some sense out of that. So first, let me show you what it looks like. So this is Tanner 1, 2, so pre-pubertal or just starting puberty. And you can see how really porous all these little teeny holes the skeleton is in the boys, and, and more porous in the girls. I mean, fairly porous in the girls, but not to the same degree as the boys. These are, we looked at what the average porosity was in the pre-early pubertal kids versus the fully mature kids, and then picked images that are representative. I didn't just pick the images that are the most dramatic. So boys have more porosity than girls, and something is going on very early um, in terms of bone modeling and with porosity. And by the time they're fully mature, the porosity is much, much less. We really couldn't figure this out. We didn't really were surprised until we found this one bone biopsy paper that showed younger kids have more porosity and that it has to do with the osteons, which are these little um, within, embedded within the cortical bone. There's a lot of remodeling activity, sort of like the, with more formation and resorption. So younger children have greater cortical porosity and a higher proportion of metabolically active osteons. We think this is what we're capturing here, but this is all brand new data. Um, but something that's happening early, pre-early puberty and more so in males and females. So this was just presented at a meeting of all the people who use this technology, and we were making the point that this mid-site captures cortical porosity in younger participants much better. Okay, next we'll spend a few minutes on fractures, and, and then we'll be done. So <clears throat> this was a study using the first generation of that machine. And not, it has a lot, it's not nearly it's good resolution. It has other problems, but and this is one that would measure at the end of the bone. And without getting into the, into the data too much, these were cross-sectional data, but the authors thought that around Tanner stage three, the boys, based on their bone, was growing really, really fast. So it's gr you're, you're really growing fast right before their very eyes, right? Boys at peak height velocity. And the hypothesis was 
the bone wasn't expanding in dimensions and getting as dense as fast. So there was this period then in boys in the middle of puberty where they were, their skeletons were more fragile. And the thinking was that that explained some gender differences and fractures. So this is a study we did using data in the UK through something that used to be called the General Practitioner Research Database. It's now called THIN, the Health Improvement Network. So we went in, uh, 6 million people, and we looked at fracture rates. And these are boys and these are girls. And so the thinking was that this very high fracture rate in these boys around puberty was because they had that sort of window of vulnerability where their bone was, was more fragile. This is what you're more used to seeing, right? In older individuals, women have much higher fracture rate than men. But look at this. This gender per difference is persisting way out up till age almost 50. So it doesn't sound to me like the higher fracture rates in boys versus girls is just about this relative fragility. So you could say that maybe it has something to do with behavior. Now, when I put up this boy with a cast skateboarding, somebody in the audience, by the time I was finished, had found a picture of a girl with a cast skateboarding that they sent to me. So, I mean, but, but I think my point is that there has to be a behavioral component of this. So then we went in deeper, and we said, let's not just look at fractures overall. Let's look at where the fractures are. And the blue is where boys are more, have higher fractures than girls, and the pink is where women or girls have higher fracture than boys. And the takeaway is this spike in fracture rates in boys isn't just limited to the long limbs, the, li the long bones that are growing, but they have higher fracture rates in their skull and their clavicles. So I think this is evidence that it's, it's, there's a huge behavior component that underlies some of the fracture differences. Okay, what do we know from animal studies? I already said it's really, really confusing, but <clears throat> I'm, I think we know that testosterone increases periosteal circumference in late puberty, and then this is the trabecular bone volume fraction, which is really about the thickness we've shown. Trabecular bone volume fraction just means you sort of have more bone there. We've shown it's the thickness. No difference in trabecular number. I didn't show that. The estrogen receptor alpha is the main regulator of skeletal acquisition in both sexes. So girls have less periosteal bone acquisition early puberty, more bone on the inner surface. Here, this higher trabecular bone volume fraction, we haven't been able to pick that up yet. We may need to enroll people, more kids. And estrogen seems to have a role increasing periosteal circumference. The IGF-1 data is really tough, and we've measured IGF-1 in all our kids. When you look at the knockouts or the animal models, it says that you don't expand the radius as effectively if you don't have IGF-1 and you know, growth hormone. But that may also be because of effects through muscle. And then to conclude, since I started out by talking about how bone accrual was so important, and there's these big gender differences, right? So the 25-year-old male has a much stronger skeleton than a 25-year-old female because the outer dimensions are bigger, the trabeculae are thicker. Um, so then what happens with aging? So Marsha can speak to this much better than I can, but the thinking is that the, as women go through menopause, they actually start to, their bone the bones become so thin that the whole architecture becomes degraded and you lose the connectivity between the bone. But really, the big gender difference is what happens on the outside surface. So this sort of funny, out, this color out here, this rusty color, is bone, men, as they age, can actually add bone to their outer circumference. Um, as the bone gets weaker, it responds by trying to get bigger. So actually, later in life, men can add bone to the outer circumference. Women can't. The inside is how you lose bone. So men and women lose bone on the inner surface, women more so, and then men can compensate with, with gains in bone on the outer surface. So um, to conclude, the sex differences in skeletal fragility, because ultimately we care about all this because we just care about fractures. So more women sustain fractures in men because they start with a smaller skeleton at peak, and trabecular bone loss is precedes by more architectural disruption and women have a skeleton that adapts less well to aging through being able to expand the periosteum. So um, I have tons of people I could acknowledge. The early studies that involved 1,000 kids included many, many, many people at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia who helped me. But for the high-resolution CT data that I just showed you, this is the crew for our lab out on Arostradero, um, including Andrew Barkhart, who's an, actually an engineer from UCSF who does all the finite element analyses. Um, Jen's our statistician. Kyle and Ariana obtained the scans. And so they deserve a lot of credit for all that work. OK, thank you. Oh, I want to say one last thing about the Maternal and Child Health Research Institute. That's why it's up there. We have lots and lots of great grants. 
go on our website. If you get ideas coming out of this conference for something you really want to study, especially if you want to work with people across campus, <laughs> do so. Check out the website and all the grants.